Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. My co-hosts are not with me yet. Hall has had some audio issues that he's trying to figure out. But welcome to the Burgundy Zone, everybody. The, we're part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. The title of this episode is The High Altitude Feud, and we are joined by none other than Sam Fortier of the Washington Post. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Thursday evening, sir. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Of course, Sam. I know that you recently um, had a write-up on Russell Wilson in the Sam Howell comp because somebody that I OG who I talked to through DMs has said that a while ago that like his comp for Sam Howell was Russell Wilson. So I thought it was very telling that Sam himself said, he, look, he watched a lot of Drew Brees and compares himself to Russell Wilson. So please tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I mean, you know, there's a lot of similarities, you know, both really good baseball players who ultimately chose football, chose playing quarterback, went to college in North Carolina, <laughs> tore up the ACC, fell in the draft and and were, you know, thrust into pretty challenging situations to complement uh, a, a strong defense as raw, promising prospects earlier in their career. So, I mean, you know, a lot of parallels between the guys, and especially when you look at offensive facets that they excel in a lot of rpo a lot of quarterback run good deep balls both of them as well so it makes a lot of sense why sam who was in middle school when russell wilson was drafted looked up to him and you know really tried to emulate his game off him yeah and sam we were at that game last week and obviously it's very different from watching it live um at the field then you go back and watch it later just real quick before we get to the next question what were your thoughts on sam howell's game against the cardinals like Ron said, like Eric Bieniemy said, like anybody I think who watched the tape said, <laughs> lots of lots of good, lots of you know really questionable stuff. You know, I mean the playmaking that uh, that you saw and on the two touchdowns in particular, you love to see that. And then obviously he takes two sacks that I think are of the six that are directly on him, and he tries to make a play. You know when he's backed up and he ends up having that sack fumble for a touchdown, which is a, a huge negative play you can't have. So. I mean, good, bad, growing pains that you expect from a young guy in a new system. I agree with you. Now we are joined by my co-host, Michael Hall. Are you there, sir? Now your your microphone's not working now. Check your microphone settings. Um, I know, of course. But real quick, Sam, what were some highlights from EB's press conference today? A lot of people have said, like, I the big takeaway is a big communicator, EB, and I think Today, one of the most telling things was, I think it was Nikki who at, or John asked him about his first time first time with Washington calling plays. And he kind of talked about, you know, us having to catch ourselves a little bit. Kind of talk about that press conference today. Uh, uh, what do you mean us having to catch ourselves? Uh, as play callers, he, he made a comment that he themselves, they had to adjust it. And it was like that was fun to be able to do that. Yeah, that was uh, – I asked that question actually. Um, that was you, my bad, Sam. Yeah, so – you know, obviously, when you're talking about getting in the flow of a game, and he's called plays before somewhat, but he wasn't the primary play caller. So, you know, to see him kind of go through and execute the game plan and, and talk about, hey, adapting to game flow, which is the thing that obviously Scott Turner got really criticized for. So particularly in the second half, late in the fourth quarter, when you have those two drives and third and 20, third and 25, then to say, okay, you know what, the passing offense isn't working, whether it's on Sam or the line, um, and and for us to go out and run the ball, uh, you know, for, for Eric Bien to be saying for us to go out and run the ball 14 times in the last 17 plays and, and kind of put the hammer down and, and say, you know, the defense is going to go out and win it for us. Uh, they're going to keep this advantage. And for Sam to stay locked in and, and then run that touchdown in like that was very promising. Absolutely. And Hall, is your microphone working? Uh, I don't know. You tell yes. me. Awesome. It's been a long ass day. Um. <laughs> I can't even remember my question now, Mark. Oh, yeah. So you, you mentioned Eric bien me and a lot was made about the play calling, like you mentioned. It, it went pass heavy a lot, which me personally, I kind of like that because it's a passing league and I want Sam to get all the reps he can as far as like reading defenses. But do you think that's um, going to be um, kind of like the how the offense is going to look going forward, kind of a pass heavy, pass first? Or do you think it's going to be um, along, the, along the lines of kind of Andy Reid where he kind of switches his uh, – his game style up every weekend to, to, for the opponent. 
Yeah, I think you're certainly going to see adaptations. I think they would like to be a little more pass heavy just because passing is more efficient than running. Everybody knows it. The the worst passing offense is better than the best rushing offense when you talk about yards per attempt. And so that's the thing that people want to do. But again, like if your offensive line or if your quarterback can't stop taking sacks and then all of a sudden you're ending up in with huge negative plays or, you know, Sadiq Charles had a hold. So like if, if you're, if you're getting those penalties, if your passing offense isn't working, then you're going to need to switch it up. And I think that even if, even if you are pass heavy, you do need to be better in the run game. Last year, Washington was successful, but they were not very explosive. You know, the mm. longest, um, you know, the, the longest plays that they had weren't very explosive. And and I think they'll they'll try to do that by getting Antonio Gibson in space this year. Um, Brian Robinson, I think, has a, has a, a lower ceiling in terms of explosiveness. But, I mean, look, like, I think that – I think you want to be a pass-first offense. I totally get that. And then uh, going into this game, Denver's defense, they're third against the run in the NFL. And a lot of people say, yeah, that's one game. But they went against Josh Jacobs and the Oakland Raiders offense. That's that's a hefty pull. These are some good defensive tackles there up front for the Denver Broncos. How much of a concern do you think it's going to be with this offensive line going against this defensive line? Because the running game, a lot of people will say that's a quarterback's best friend. Yeah, I mean – this, I mean, this defense is is for sure legit, and it, it actually kind of strikes me as pretty ironic that that you know we're talking about a Denver team that has to you know keep games close, and and the defense has to ball out because Russell Wilson isn't doing the things that he used to do, that the things that we're so used to seeing from from Russell Wilson in Seattle. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this this defense poses a challenge. You're you're gonna have to win up front. I think that there were some positive moments for this line, but also so, some real negatives. You know, Andrew Wiley getting beat on that sack fumble. Mm-hmm. Um, it, but but Sam, you know, the play that stands out to me is Sam Cosme and pass protection coming across the formation to hit that guy. Um, so I mean, I would say that Ron Rivera says, you know, they need to be, they know they need to be better. Um, they know that they didn't invest a ton in their offensive line, and they think that the line is going to be greater than the sum of its parts. But you know, this is a real good test uh, this week. And then uh, to piggyback off of that. Logan Thomas led the team in targets with eight last weekend against the Cardinals. Do you think that was just a situational matchup kind of thing, or do you expect that to be a consistent theme going forward? I mean, Eric Bieniemy today suggested that it was a, a game flow thing. It okay. was a, it, it was it was a happenstance thing because Terry McLaurin, I believe, had three targets, maybe four. Um, and and you know when you have a top paid receiver like that, who you know his peers get the ball a lot more than he does, uh, you want to make sure that the thing that happened with Carson Wentz last year doesn't happen again, where, right. where he's just not getting the ball until the second half of games, particularly if you're going to throw the ball. And, and Eric Bieniemy said, Hey, look, like it's week one. We're, we're figuring it out. Like we're going to get all our guys, the ball. And so uh, I, to me, like it, it's harder to manufacture touches for an X receiver. I mean, you can, you can do some things. You can run them on a jet sweep or whatever, get the ball in his hands, but like it is harder to get the ball in his hands than, than some of that shorter quick game stuff that goes to Logan or, or some of the, you know, Jahan, some of the other guys. And so I want to see them develop their rapport for sure. And I think that you can schematically get Terry involved early because Terry still is your best receiver. Yeah, definitely got to get Terry involved. <clears throat> um, switching over to the defensive side of the ball, going back to last year, Washington gave up over 120 yards rushing 11 out of the 17 games last year. And then you saw James Conner here and there kind of gashed him up the middle do you think that the run defense is a problem for this team or is that more of a situational thing where teams run the ball on them more because of the pass rush and the back end guys playing on the back end? And is that going to be a key factor going into Denver this Sunday? Yeah. I don't know what the numbers are, but for me, I don't really worry about how many hundred yard rushers they've allowed. And some people might think that's like Hmm. crazy to say, but when I'm looking at the efficiency, like I'm pretty sure Washington was one of the better, I want to say top 10 defenses last year against the run in terms of EPA, um, expected points added, and mm. and and DVOA. I know that um, they were 12th in yards allowed last season. Yeah. And, and so different than what you're talking about, obviously. Right, right. For me, I guess, like the, the hard part for me is when you look at games like Indianapolis or Atlanta or some of those teams that were real big run the ball teams – they would chew up yards, but they were super inefficient with it. So like you would still only need to score 17, 20 points to beat them. And obviously Washington's offense wasn't great, but, but I think Indianapolis was, was a great example of that where, you know, they're, 
they're running the ball, but but the cost is pretty high. Um, and so you don't worry about explosive offenses in the same way that if you're playing Josh Allen or, or Jalen Hurts right. or Patrick Mahomes, like they could they could you know they could take the top off and, and, and no problem. And I think so. Here's the thing: is like for me, this defensive front, like one of their strengths is you know you win with four, you don't have to blitz all the time, and you can put people you know in in negative situations. David Harrison of SI pointed out the other day. I thought it was really great. Like the first. Um, game of the season 10 out of the 11 drives Washington had either a, a TFL or a sack and when you're creating explosive plays like that on defense and you're, you're putting people behind the sticks and getting them out of their rhythm like that's huge because they can't rely on the run game so I think they're pretty strong against the run game just on the film and, and on some of the advanced stats but I, I'm not I'm not super worried about their run defense right now but I, it, you know you're, it's totally fair to bring up and, and say like hey, this could be a concern going forward. Absolutely. And I think what you were just to elaborate on what you were saying, I'm just going to paraphrase, but I, I would imagine it's the explosive plays that they're more worried about limiting rather than the six to seven yard runs. You know, like in, they don't want the 20 yard runs. They don't want the 20 plus yard passing, but they'd much rather the lower stuff to your point. But to wrap this up, Sam, I only have a couple more questions for you. Injury report update. Chase Young was a full participant today or trending up to playing in Denver. So I would I would put a little grain of salt on the you know full participant because they were only wearing shells that weren't in pads. Um, you know I think it's possible that he plays Sunday, but it still seems like week three is a more realistic target. Just you know coming back, uh, the doctors will have to clear him for that. So I mean, yeah, it's it's always good when when someone advances on the injury report gets gets to be a full participant. But uh, you know I I would certainly not read too much into that. Absolutely. Next question I have for you, the defensive goals facing Russell Wilson. Obviously you did a little scouting report on Russell doing that right up for us. So what, what do you, what does Wash's defense have to do to Russell Wilson in order to put them in a really good position? Yeah, I, th I think it's, you know, contain him in the running game, uh, you know, limit some of the, you know, down the field stuff by playing, you know, deeper coverages. I know Jack Del Rio plays a ton of quarters. So, so I thought that shouldn't be a problem, but it's actually to me, you know, I talked to an NFC executive, uh, senior personnel guy, mm. and and who's not involved with with Denver or Washington, but he said like Russell. It's it's pretty easy to say that Russell is no longer an arrow up player at mm. 34 years old, and particularly with a skill set that doesn't necessarily age super gracefully. But he said it's it's debatable to even call Russell like an arrow across player. He really thinks that. Russell, just in terms of what he did last year, what he could be doing last, you know, what he saw just in week one is an arrow down player that, that we're seeing his skill set mm. diminish. And I and I wonder if if he's going to be capable of executing the Sean Payton offense to the full breadth that he would like. And I know that obviously it was one week and he's dropped the weight and Ron Rivera spoke glowingly about Russell um, in the press conference because you never want to give an opponent like bulletin board material. But I do think that unless something drastic happens, unless Sean Payton can figure out how to, how to fix him. I think we're not going to see the same Russell Wilson that we got used to for so many years in Seattle. Um, so, so that's not to say he, he can't win. He still has a good arm. He still does a lot of really great things, but I almost am, you know, maybe it's heretical to say, but uh, I'm not as worried about Russell Wilson as maybe you would have been in the past. And, and that is still saying he's a very good player um, who obviously you have to worry about. Uh, yeah, it's Russell Wilson. You know, you don't ever want to sleep on that guy. Um, Next question that I have for you, EB, obviously being from Colorado, playing college there, do you think he kind of has a leg up on that high altitude kind of uh, the sickness and other stuff like that? It's funny. We were talking to John Allen today in the locker room, and, you know, he's played there, plenty, you know, a couple times before, and he said it is something but I try not to make it too big and, and Denver, you know, has those signs outside their locker room where they talk about altitude sickness and no matter how good a shape you're in, you're going to be challenged. But I think the advantage that EB has really doesn't even have to do with him playing there. I think it has to do with the conditioning that they did like during training camp and how many plays they got through. Like every player talks about how hard training camp was and, and how many reps they got in and, um, you know, Jack Del Rio talked about Montez Sweat playing 80 something percent of the snaps last week, which is the fourth highest rate of his career. Mm. And, you know, whenever you're talking about altitude, I think that's really what you're talking about is conditioning, challenging someone's, you know, cardio. So I think that they should be OK. Absolutely. Love to hear that now. Sir, prediction hat. I'm not sure if you can or not. Your prediction for this game. How do you think it's going to shape out and who do you think the MVP will be? 
Well, I mean, so Vegas has Denver as a three and a half point favorite, which feels fair to me. Um, I don't know. I, I always like, especially early in the season, it's always tough because, you know, I feel like I've been watching this team a lot and, and I'm, I'm like kind of, you know, bought in because I've been hearing about and writing about the advancement that they're making. I think that Washington can, can, can win this game. I don't think it's necessarily likely, but I think they absolutely can. So I would probably take Washington 27, 24, 24, 21, something like that. Um, Although I will say that, you know, when we talk about field goal games, Cameron Cheeseman, his long snapping has, has really been suspect Uh, all camp. We saw it in week one, Tressway is the holder really, really really bailed them out. Um, So I I would say Washington wins, uh, but it's close. And the MVP, if Washington's going to win, I would have to pick an MVP probably on defense to limit them. And if Montez Sweat plays like he did, if Cam Curl can come up with one of those picks that he he dropped last week, both those guys seem like candidates to me. So you're saying I should put my entire bank account on them to cover? I think I think covering, yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> yeah, just don't be mad at Sam if it doesn't work out that way. Of course. <laughs> All right, um, real quick, Sam. Last question, just real, real quick. I know it's the last one. Um, do you think there's any like revenge sort of um, between coaches here? Just because Ron and Sean played each other so much. Yeah, and Sean's comments over the off. Um, I think last off saying potential ownership was asking him, courting him to come coach here. Kind of a. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would be surprised by that. Okay. I mean, there's always going to be some some personal elements. Right. That is is one of them. But you know, Washington obviously tried to trade for Russell Wilson a long time ago, and right. and Vance Dallas Joseph, and, <laughs> Vance Joseph, and you know Eric Bieniemy are, are longtime friends who went to college together. So, I mean, there's there's all, always going to be something like that. But I would be surprised if if Ron was thinking about Sean's comments this week. Okay, I got you. I'm with you on that. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you for coming on here and educating us with your expert opinion, yeah. sir. Have a great weekend. Uh, before you get out of here, you just want to plug your social media handle, just in case anybody watching hasn't followed you yet. Uh, S-A-M, the number four T-R. S-A-M, the number four T-R on Twitter. Appreciate you, Sam. Have a great weekend, brother. Enjoy the Thanks, game. Thanks, guys. Appreciate I'll it. see you. Thanks, brother. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. Sam Fortier. Always appreciate having Sam on the yes, show. Sir. Uh, Reed, unfortunately, has to work late tonight. Um, and, you know, that happens. It is what it is. We're all better together. But, you know, uh, no I thought he got there. suspended for his comments last week when we had Mitch or yesterday, the other keep day when we had Mitch on. We keep that in house. Uh, my, so mic, my mic's not working. Is it working yet? I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But before we get into our next guest here, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that I saw on film. The, the Broncos, their defensive line is legit, man. They make some freaking plays. And uh, we're going to ha- – and look, they're sick third in rushing yards right now, giving up only 61 to the Raiders. It kind of tells you what you're facing with this defensive line. And one thing I will say, Vance Joseph, he does send a lot of pressure. So those running backs, they better get ready to pass block in this game. Yeah. Um, as far as the defensive line goes, I will say, like, they're probably better than Arizona's line, yes. And obviously they just gave up six sacks. But it's a week-to-week league, so we'll see how they do this week. And as far as them, like, holding Josh Jacobs to, what did you say, it was like 40-something yards, whatever it was? 61. 61 yards. Okay, yeah. Um, I more chalked that up to Josh Jacobs, just like a lot of players coming into week one, missed the whole offseason, didn't have any preseason. Maybe he's feeling a little bit rusty because I'm not going to – like, obviously, Denver has a stout defense. They got Patrick Sertain on the outside. Uh, they got Randy Gregory, came from Dallas. They got another defensive end on the other side who's pretty good, but – I feel as if they can get got as far as like in the running game. And I feel like maybe a guy like Brian Robinson, who's there throughout the preseason, Antonio Gibson, who played throughout the preseason, it's already has that conditioning in them. I feel like they have a slightly better chance as uh, far as carrying the ball against this defense. But again, it's week to week league. So we'll see. Yeah. And now before we are joined by our next guest, let's answer this fan question from the Colonel. It's a really good one. He asks, Hall, Denver didn't look good in their loss to the Raiders last week. Is there anyone explosive on their offense we will be keying in on? I'm not particularly impressed with any of their weapons, he says. Yeah, um, obviously, if you uh, kind of follow throughout the league, defense, or Den- the Denver lost a couple receivers throughout the offseason. Tim Patrick had a season-ending injury. Uh, KJ Hamler had like a heart issue, so they put him on the uh, injured reserve. Or I think they actually released him, actually, after um, all that. But... So I think Jerry Judy is probably the only receiver that you really have to 
be concerned about explosive plays and just uh, like the guy on the outside because he's a great route runner. He has the speed, great hands. And obviously, like we just talked about, Russell Wilson still has the arm. He might not have the mobility, but he still has the arm to get the ball down the field and push the ball down the field. So he's one guy that you have to worry about on offense. And obviously in the backfield, you got Javante Williams and Samaj P. Ryan, who we know from uh, being in Washington. But again, I think it comes down to if we stop their run game, I think we have a pretty good chance. But if you're just talking about explosive players, Jerry Judy, who is, I guess, trending towards playing, is maybe probably the only guy you got to worry about on the outside. Oh, they got Cortland Sutton, too. Forgot about him, but I feel like he's more of that uh, that red zone kind of 50-50 uh, guy anyway. So, uh, For me, I'll say it's the running backs. Javante Williams, even at North Carolina, he was an excellent pass blocker. He almost decapitated one guy, and it was I actually felt bad for him. And th- this is a running back who's performing the block. Um, but I saw him do it against the Raiders. He comes up and help, and he, he pancaked a blitzing linebacker. He's still doing the same things he did before. That being said, when I was in high school, we played against a team called, I think it was Einstein, who we played against. And we knew going into that game that what they like to do is they like to run the ball up the middle. And once it got everyone kind of constricted around that bubble there, then that running back would just dip out of that backside lane and just run outside and just force everyone to chase him. And honestly, we knew it going into it, but it was still highly effective just by the pace of the game and the way things worked. Javante Williams likes to do that a lot, especially here at Denver, because Denver's offensive line is good at run blocking, but it's not like they're moving guys out the way. So look for Javante, especially when he gets to those middle situations. They use a lot of tight ends. He's going to try to bounce outside, and he is a hard runner, man. He's just running through arm tackles, and if he's not the hardest runner on the team, then Samaj P. Ryan is. I saw him just smack uh, Spillane out of the way and just keep chugging up field. He's still humming, dude. Great running back that he is. So For me, it's the running backs are going to be huge. One thing I saw on film, the Broncos rarely, rarely throw the ball in shotgun. Rarely. Very, very weird. Now, the next question from the Colonel Hall. One reason the Cardinals came close to upsetting us last weekend is because Jonathan Gannon, their new head coach, was the defensive coordinator for the Eagles last year. He is very familiar with our team. That said, it also means he is very familiar with the New York Giants, who were shut out 40-0 to zero at home against Dallas. What happens to the Giants traveling to, to uh, temp this weekend? Oh, Tempe, Arizona. Yeah. Oh, my um, bad. I was like, Tempe. I was like, my bad. <laughs> I know. It took me a minute, too. I was like, oh, yeah. Um, I think that, yes, he knows their, he knows our offense. He knows our team. Technically, he knows the Giants. But I think last, or this past Sunday was not really Jonathan Gannon and their defense knowing, um, like, our how, the, how we play and, like, our team. I think that was more of the commanders beating, almost beating themselves as opposed to Jonathan Gannon kind of coaching them up and the, the Arizona Cardinals beating us. But but that being said, I think that uh, I saw that the Giants are like minus four and a half favorites. Uh, they're probably going to cover that. I expect them to bounce back off that ass whooping they took from Dallas last week, 40 to nothing. I think that Daniel Jones is going to have a field day running the ball on them. Saquon's going to go crazy. But, yeah, I wouldn't worry about – I mean, I wish Arizona would knock the Giants off. That would be nice for us. But I just don't see that happening this week. Uh, I do expect the Giants to play much better. I I think that they probably will win this game. But one, my brother was texting me about Dallas and them looking incredible, so to speak. And I said, "Look, Mike, like this is what Dallas's defense is geared toward. The way that you beat Dallas's defense is by running the football. When you give up turnovers, give up sacks, get up, and you get down early." Dallas is in a great situation with their pass rush and with the Giants offensive line. That's just a recipe for disaster. And that's what we saw was a shellacking. And so when the circumstances are different going against Arizona, I think that the Giants are probably going to do a little bit better because that pass rush isn't as evident as it was, you know, with Dallas, so to speak. Uh, But, you know, I just want to make sure everyone knows that, like, everyone's hyping up Dallas with that. I think that was just a perfect recipe for success for the Dallas Cowboys. Like, Dak didn't have to do anything, really, you know, and look, it is what it is. But I do think that the Cardinals are a lot better. I I was thinking this last week or Monday. I didn't want to say anything to anybody, but Arch said it in our Discord, and I agree with him. Could the Arizona Cardinals be this year's Detroit Lions or New York Giants, so to speak, that that team that – isn't going to blow you away off the roster, but they're going to play good fundamental football and they're going to lose close games, if that makes sense. And I kind of can see that because they are a good structured team, but I do think that 
in the long run, I don't think they're set up for success. I think once injuries and stuff like that happens, it's everything's going to fall into the rubble. The only way Arizona is going to be playing close with any team this entire season is if they play like the way that we played week one, which is turn the ball over multiple times, give them short fields. And even with the short fields, they only scored nine points. So, like, and well, if give credit we don't to our turn defense, though. Yeah, well, of course, of course. But I'm just like, Giants have a pretty all right defense, too. But my whole point is, they don't have enough offensive power to, right? Like literally, not even outscore anybody. They don't have enough offensive power to even get close to outscoring anybody or keeping it close with anybody. Like I said, I, unless you're gonna play like we did and like kind of almost beat yourself, I don't see Arizona winning many games this year. No, no, I didn't mean like they'd be winning a lot of games. Or keeping like, it close. Like, I don't even really see them keeping it close. I do. I think that defense is legit. I think Gannon is good. But it is crazy that Baldinger had that one um, breakdown today, and he showed that they came out with only 10 defenders <laughs> yeah. against us on one play. And it was exactly. the one – they were missing a D end, and nobody noticed yeah. it. I was screaming at, at the screen when I watched on the all twenty. When I watched, it, I was like, "Why aren't you running right there? Like, why are we throwing? They don't have a D lineman Run it right at them." Yeah, I don't you even know? think they noticed that. Yeah, you know, it is what it is. Whatever. Not gonna get uh, mad over it, but I'm tired of talking about the Cowboys and that Giants game. I was really happy to see it, by the way, because a lot of people were using Dayball as a way to uh, get at Ron Rivera and everything. And what I said back then was, "Look, you can do great with what somebody has given you, but when you actually have to keep building on top of it." Let's see how that continues to work out for you. And I do, I am glad they gave Daniel Jones that big contract. Really am happy. Now let's go to our questions in the Discord chat server. Our boy, Tim Towner. It seems that they may have been living in fantasy land all preseason. That, in fact, we struggled against Arizona, who the entire world sees as the worst team in the league. If this is true, what will we see in Week 2 versus Denver? Turnovers? Penalties? Sacks? Busted coverages? breakaway touchdown runs or we will we see the opposite or a mix um i still think it'll be a mix of week one i don't think there's going to be any breakaway breakaway runs i don't see any busted coverage is happening just because i feel like the secondary uh, is pretty sound i mean you got Derek forrest and cam curl playing back there a lot of the defense has been in the same system for the past three four years now minus like the rookies and Derek forrest so the communication part, I'm not really worried about that. Um, any, like, busted coverages and whatnot. Uh, I do think we'll see a couple penalties here and there, like holding penalties, maybe whatnot, stuff like that on the offensive side of the ball. But as far as defense goes, I think that uh, we'll get the same output or better that we did against Arizona as far as uh, tackles for loss, sacks, um, just stuff in the run, breaking up passes. And But as far as offense goes, I think, it'll, like you said, it'll be a mixed bag. I think you'll see a lot of what you saw in Arizona or against Arizona. You'll see some big plays. You'll see some um, nice like plays by made by Sam Howe. And you also probably see, because like Eric Bannamy said, Vance Joseph started as a secondary coach and he's a defensive coordinator for Denver. So he's really good at mixing, mixing up coverages pre-snap and then switching to another coverage of after the ball snap, kind of confusing young quarterbacks. So I expect Sam to – have his ups and his downs again, and I think that he'll make enough plays to get the job done, but uh, I think it'll be another mixed bag on offense and probably a similar or better performance on defense. Yeah, Tim, for me personally, I think that we're going to see um, two teams that are very evenly matched, um, even though regardless of what you said, if what they say is true about Arizona being one of the worst teams in the league. All I'm saying is I, I, these teams are very similar in the way that they're constructed, you could say in a way except for wide receiver, obviously at this point because they are injured. That being said, I could see breakaway runs happening against us, especially attacking the edges. Sometimes, like we saw in that Andre Jones um, one botch play where he goes too far inside, loses his contain on the wraparound, and that was a huge play. That's something that Denver probably is watching because they like to attack those edges. They want to be able to do that. Um, but that being said, I think with Eric, with this offense of Denver, this defense is really going to have to tackle, and they're going to have to fight through tackles. There can't be any missed tackles. What Denver likes to do is that, do that misdirection, then hit you with that quick game outside. You know, do the play action, hit you outside. When that happens, your guys are going to be on an island. And so our DBs, our linebackers, they're going to have to wrap up. I don't care if you're on the ground, you're holding them by the ankle. Just hold them until somebody else can get there because these are really hard guys to bring down. So I could see missed tackles. I could, and offensively, I could see penalties. Um, because of what happened last week, I could see his offensive line saying six sacks is not going to happen again, and they'll do whatever they can in order to stop that. And I could definitely see 
penalties being an issue on Sunday in that regard? Great question. Thank you, brother. Next question from Deluxe. Hit some fans are setting unrealistic expectations for offense or <laughs> are some fans setting unrealistic expectations for our offense early? Two regular season starts for the QB. Teams will blitz early and often to rattle him. Four new starters in the O-line. People are concerned about running back's vision. They probably aren't used to seeing holes after last year. It's a new offense going to start with limited um, offense and expand as the season goes. The, those are some of my thoughts, but want to know what you think, Hall. Um, I would say... I would say some fans probably set unfair expectations just because of what you saw in the preseason even though they weren't going against starters every single time they played in the preseason. And, yeah, so the line was holding up and Sam was, like, pushing the ball down the field. But if you want to look back to the Arizona game, I think that while they were, like, uh, more pass-heavy than run in the first half especially, I think – and they weren't really pushing the ball down the field. I think that had to do with more of Arizona was crowding the line of scrimmage and playing a lot of people in the box – so they want to just get the quick game and the intermediate stuff out and um, in the passing game. But I do think that um, – what was the question again? I lost my train of thought. Are fans setting unrealistic? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I do think that uh, some fans some fans did set some um, unfair expectations. And just because, again, Eric Benny coming from Kansas City, I think a lot of people expected to see, like I said, what they saw in the preseason, a lot of exotic stuff, a lot of – pre-snap motion stuff, a lot of jet sweep stuff and misdirection stuff. But I think they just wanted to keep it basic against Arizona for the most part because they felt like they could – it's not really like – and this is like my viewpoint of it, not like how they were probably thinking, but they could probably like do the bare minimum or like just run like the simple stuff to kind of get by Arizona and then coming into Denver week two, maybe they get a little bit more exotic. But at the end of the day, young quarterback, new system – they're probably not trying to put the entire playbook on them at once. They're trying to only run like similar, like uh, simple stuff, maybe like stuff where Sam cuts the field in half and only has to read half the field, stuff like that. The quick game, the screen. So I do think that the offense as the season goes on is going to get better and better, improve and improve as, as well. They'll basically be as good as the offensive line is. If the offensive line improves and keeps getting better week to week, I think the offense in turn will get in better week to week because you're going to set up, be able to set up more in the passing game. The only thing that really concerns me is the running game, just for the simple fact that if you go back to last year, they were really inefficient in the running game, even though they ran the ball. I think they were top five, even top three in rushing attempts last year, but only averaged less than four yards a carry. So, And then this past week, they only averaged – both running backs averaged less than four yards a carry. So if you do have any big concerns about the offense, I would say the running game and the – the fact that they're not really efficient in the running game. So that's really my biggest concern as it is right now. Uh, that was for me as well, um, brother, because obviously Brian Roberts averaged at 3.1. Look, he ran the ball hard, of course, but as an efficiency perspective overall of the team, you need to have that better running game. So it makes it easier for Sam Howell and you could score more points. You know what I mean? Um, I don't think I don't think they're unrealistic, me personally. You know, in the wise words of Walt Disney, it's fun to do the impossible. And, yeah, a lot of people are sitting here saying, well, Sam Howell's a young quarterback. It's, a, it's his second start, blah, blah, blah. I understand that, but I, I know that this kid is better than Carson and Taylor, and so I'm going to expect more. I think that Eric Bieniemy is 10 times better than Scott Turner. I'm going to expect more, and that's just the fact of the matter. We're not going to face Arizona every week. We can sit here and say, yeah, it's the first game, blah, blah, blah. It only gets harder, man. We're going against some legit competition this year, and if you really want to make a stance in this league, do you think Eric Bieniemy is okay with just being middle of the tier, 500? No, he wants to make some noise, and he wants to go against the best. That's who he's gone against, so you have to play like the best. And this offense, in particular, did not do that on Sunday, but the fact is, in years past, they would have lost that game. But I feel like there is a confidence building in this football team where – even though the Arizona Cardinals can play the game of their life and we play like preseason, we still win the game. We still find a way to crawl across the finish line. And I think that Eric Bieniemy highlighting that today was perfect. And he's absolutely right about that. I think it, it showed maturation with this team that they, like they made the plays to be able to get it done. And you wouldn't have seen that two years ago. You know what I mean? Now the next question from uh, Scott, from Andy Lockhart in the UK. Oi, 
Why is Kyle Boy. so bad at pool? I don't know, man. I wish I knew. I wish I knew Lockhart. I'm not as good as you, though. You know, you proved that last <laughs> week, and I, I played terribly, even though I hit that one good shot. Now, the next question, <laughs> Chris Comerton in the Discord. Do you think EB will open up the playbook hall a little more this week, considering Denver's defense is a pretty, pretty solid secondary? Hoping we use Turner more over Thomas. Just wish Turner had Thomas's blocking skills. Yeah, um, as far as Thomas goes, I think, again, just like a lot of players, he was coming off the injury. I mean, look at a guy like Joe Burrow. Same injury as Logan, calf, calf injury. He comes out against Cleveland, throws for 82 yards. Are people ready to be, oh, they need to cut Joe Burrow like a lot of people on Twitter were? No. Give the guy some time. He's coming back off the injury. He missed the preseason, missed majority of the training camp. I think Logan Thomas, dating back to the early offseason before he had the injury, was looking great. So I think he'll eventually get back to that as far as he moves uh, farther and farther away from the injury. But with that being said, uh, I forgot the question again, dog. It's been a long ass day. <laughs> You're good. Do you think EB will open up the playbook a little bit? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I think that uh, uh, I think he'll add a little bit more to the playbook this week. I think we'll see a little bit more as far as the deep shots or like the uh, a little bit more exotic stuff. But again, I think it goes they're not trying to put everything in the playbook on Sam's plate at once. I think they're trying to make it simple for him, let him get his uh, keep getting his feet wet. And like they said, every time he goes out, more than likely, it's the first time he's done this, done that, experienced this, experienced that on the football field as a starter. So I think that they're doing the right thing by kind of easing him in and not giving him too much. Like I said, making it easier for him as far as like half the field reads and just like one, two, three uh, quick reads and then if you don't got to take off. So I think that, uh, yeah, we'll see a little bit more. And if you really think about it, they did take a deep shot to Terry. They got the pass interference on that. So – they are taking shots and they are throwing the ball a little bit down the field more. But like I said, I think that uh, they're just trying to ease Sam into it a little bit. And then once he hits his stride, they'll really open up the playbook. But I do think you'll see a couple more pages out the playbook this week. Look, they're not opening up the playbook at any point. You know, like the way that I look at this is when they went into that game last week against Arizona, they're basing it off what they saw in Philly last year right they obviously know there's going to be some changes they weren't expecting for them to be sitting in a cover two as much as they did which forced everything short they went into that game maybe expecting quarters more man coverage to take shots and when they were doing more so two man deep cover two they had said okay we got to adjust some things and that's why they started running the ball more in the rain and everything because again zone running the ball is probably better than when a blitz so to speak so uh, this week, you know, Reed makes fun of me all the time about talking about the correlation with Pokemon cards. You know, when you go against fire, you want that water Pokemon. You want to be able to have more effectiveness, right? It's the same thing with this. Vance Joseph, who we know is his best friend, uh, Eric Ben, we talked about today, he runs a completely different defense than what Gannon does. They, they do different things. And so what this offense has is they have different plays to attack different coverages. So, yeah, you're going to say, yeah, it's, they're opening up the playbook a little bit more. I say it's not opening up the playbook. It's just using the playbook, the plays against the coverage that they are expecting. It's not that they aren't, like, using the other ones. They have more to use. It's just based on what you have in front of you and how you can beat it as fast and as good as possible. Um, so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's about that at all, man. I really don't. I, I think that Sam Howell has – a really good grip on this offense seeing him go through his progressions i talked about this in the spaces the other day he's miles ahead of where usual quarterbacks are in their second career start he's going through his progressions he's seeing what's happening he isn't completely running away with his hair on fire he does make a little bit minute uh, mistakes but nobody's going to be tom brady you know it's going to take time obviously but my whole point is he's got to limit those mistakes as much as freaking possible as much as freaking possible now, the next question that we have is from Tim Towner. What are your thoughts on the play of Cody Barton? Have not looked into it myself, but he played 100% of the D snaps, and we gave up 100, almost 100 yards rushing. What say you, Tim? What say you, Hall? Yeah, uh, I think he was the lowest graded uh, player as far as like PFF grades go. I think he was like in the 40s or something like that. Um, obviously, everyone saw the, the – I don't know everyone, but I, I think a lot of people saw the, the uh, clip on Twitter of him just getting like – basically pushed off the screen by a lineman in a, uh, in a run pass and a run blocking uh, play. So I know there was like mixed up and downs with him throughout the uh, preseason and training camp where 
some days he was like really fitting the run gaps good and getting sideline to sideline running around making plays and there was some days where I forgot to put it on vibrate. Some days yeah, my, where my uh, dad just called me, so I was like, "Is he calling you?" <laughs> <laughs> There's some days where you're gonna see what a lot of people saw, like circulating on Twitter, where he's getting blown like uh, out of the out of the uh, screen, pretty much by a lineman, or he's uh, picking the wrong run gap or fitting the wrong fitting the wrong hole in the run game. So hopefully, as he kind of again learns and grows into the defense, because Technically, he's like the new guy along with Forbes and uh, pretty much just Forbes on the defense as far as starters go. He's the new guy. A lot of everyone else has been in the system for a little bit now. So hopefully he's getting uh, acclimated to it. But, yeah, he's got to step it up or uh, honestly might have to uh, look at somewhere else, get someone else on the field. Well, I think that he did all right uh, from what I saw. He- you know, it's kind of those situations where it's his first game, obviously, with Washington. And I don't, I, it is telling that he's getting 100% of the snaps and Jameis getting 65. You know, we talked about all offseason. This is obviously Jameis' spot, but Barton was coming for it, and obviously he did get it. Um, they might have different ideas on how to use them, uh, especially this weekend with the running backs going against them. Uh, but it's. <sighs> I'm not going to jump off the ship of Cody Barton just yet. You know, a lot of people uh, will pick on Cody. You know, I, I'm not going to do that just yet. He's, But this is going to be a big test this weekend. We need the best out of Cody going against these running backs, and especially Jamin too. This can't be one of those games where Jamin loses sight of his assignment. You know, he gets outside, and, and now we're chasing a guy 30 yards down the field. You know, that cannot happen in this game. Now, the next question that we have is also from Tim Towner. Really, really good one. Week one was EB's first as our OC and not tied to Andy Reid. What do you think he learned about game preparation, play calling, and his players? Uh, Well, as far as play calling, he said today that he's actually, like, called plays, like, multiple times. It was just a ridiculous narrative that he's never called plays before. And, like, all right, this is his first time. But I think that uh, just he's like saying and not tied to Andy Reid. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm just saying like he's he's called plays before. Like a lot yeah. of people are making it like big, like, oh, this is his first time ever calling plays. And can he really do it? But yeah. he, he you, and today. I, you and I hypothetically talked about, you know, that Super Bowl in the second half that like I've talked about before. Like how crazy is it to say that Andy goes in with his game plan? And if something's not working, he goes, hey, let's switch to Eric's. Let's switch right. to Eric's plays. And like that. W- imagine that as a head coach as an offensive minded head coach, having that luxury to say, if my preparation, what I have, doesn't work, I can lean on my other guy here. And you can't really tell the difference between them. Right. But, yeah, um, as far as, like, the game that he called, and I do, like, any any play caller getting into a new, like, a new environment around new players, it's going to take a little bit of time to say, all right, this is what – if I run this play, I know this guy's going to do this, that, and the third, and I know I can rely on him on this for this play. So I definitely think that uh, just like, again, yeah, just like the offensive line grows, just like Sam grows, just like everyone else in the offense grows, EB is going to grow as a play caller as well as far as, yeah. all right, I ran this, now I'm going to set up this with yeah. this. And I'm going to build on this play because I ran this earlier. They did, they gave me this look, so let me build on that play by doing this. So I think that uh, like Scott Turner didn't really have that correlation with calling plays where he's trying to set stuff up as opposed to EB. I think that as he learns like, okay, Terry runs this route at the best. Jahan runs this route, the best Curtis is the best at whatever he does, like whatever he can do in the field <laughs> that came off wrong, but he's good at like the shorter, like quick stuff. So I think that, uh, like I said, as he grows and they kind of get deeper and deeper into the playbook and depending on the opponents and the more comfortable Sam gets, I think the more that, you'll see EB get more comfortable as far as correlation and calling plays goes. Yeah, uh, what I think he learned about game preparation is that regardless of what Gannon has shown in the past, that defensive coordinators are going to adjust on you if they have enough time to do it. And I think that probably what EB had learned was having that adaptation, even though he made the switch in the second half, and obviously that pay that proved to be uh, productive for them you kind of have to be quicker like because going into that game if you expected something different you know having another having a backup plan and I know EB has talked about this before saying being prepared for the unexpected right always be prepared for the unexpected and, and I agree with him in this sense I think that that's one thing that he took away from this game it's just being a little bit quicker and recognizing the change in the uh, of what's being brought to you because obviously going against somebody like Vance Joseph who knows you better than probably not not better than anybody, but knows you very well as a best friend. Uh, you're gonna have to 
jump through some hoops because that guy knows you and he knows what you like to do. And so you got to get out of your comfort zone uh, a little bit. And then the pl- with play calling, especially, and his players, I think his players proved to him that they will drag their asses across the finish line. And I think they, I think his his quote regarding Sam Howell being at his best when they needed it the most was very telling because obviously they put themselves in that position. But the fact was they could have just laid down, not make, but they they made the plays to make it happen. And especially that throw to Curtis Samuel right before halftime. I've talked about so much already, but that was such a beautiful freaking throw, man. And that was so important to everything. And it just shows you that this team has the, they have it. They just have to be more consistent with it, if that makes sense. Like, they have the ability to say, it doesn't matter how much time is on the clock. We can sc- uh, score points when we when we need to. And that confidence building is something that can pay dividends, a, like, a lot down the road. And I hope that this offense is able to get that this season. I know it's a lot to say and a lot to ask for, but I, I think that they're prepared for it, man. Now, the next question is from Paul Murphy on Twitter Hall. Would you like to see EB attempt to feed our top receivers more often and throw deep ball more too? I know Terry was recovering from toe injury, but he was rarely targeted, as was Dotson. No real deep throws either to show off Howell's arm talent. Too many handoffs plus short passes, he says. Uh, Well, I don't know if it was too many handoffs because they outpass the as far as the play goes like they outpass more than they rush it more than they rushed in that game so (laughs) hanging around Matumba too much um so yeah um i mean do they need to run the ball and be a little bit more balanced maybe possibly but and will that open up more stuff but again it goes back to the efficiency thing like if you're not running the ball efficiently then what's the point of running the ball like you shouldn't be running the ball just for the point of or just for the fact of hey we got to run the ball here to keep them Keep them honest, like, no. If you can get the quick passing game going and the short game going, because I think on first down, on passing downs or on first down, they averaged, I think it was like 4.6 yards per play, as opposed to if they're running it on first down, it was, they, they averaged less than four yards per play. So the more efficient thing to do was to pass the ball on first down as opposed to run it. So I like the way that they did that. But um, as far as, like, the deep shots go, like I said, they took the deep shot to Terry. They got the pass interference on it. But I think it goes back to, again, how kind of being like in his second start and as he was going through his progressions, yes, he was definitely seeing things, but he wasn't seeing them seeing things clearly, I guess I should say. And even Sam said uh, when he was talking to the press or the, the media. I would, say like, there was, I would say there's little doubt. In yeah, yeah, exactly. He, you know, he was yeah. saying that like his his drops in his feet weren't, I guess, lining up with his mind, what his eyes were seeing, which is a big thing for quarterbacks. Like, your feet got to go with your eyes and your mind. So, and all three all three got to be in sync. So, I do think, again, it's his second start, so it's going to be some some doubt, some uncertainty and stuff when he's going through his regressions. But, again, he's supposedly a great self-corrector. He's very coachable, and he loves to be in the film room and grind out in film. So, I do think we'll see improvement on the offense. And, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people have hyped on the Diami Brown missed touchdown opportunity, that wheel route. And I've explained this a lot, but, you know, typically that route could be against quarters coverage or cover three. You're kind of uh, forcing the deep safety in order to get to that point where the wheel route is going with Diami. What he what happened there is that deep corner that's supposed to be on the side where Diami is actually was fading inside towards the seam. And if you see that on film, that's something you can say, hey, in this route, Sam, this is what this corner likes to do. If you see him fading inside, get that ball to Diami. He's there because this guy makes that mental mistake. But on the fly, because Sam was looking at Diami, and so it almost was like that doubt in his mind was, where is that guy? I can't see him. I want to throw this to Diami, but I I don't want to make this mistake here because I want to go to my, my actual read and Jahan Dotson 18 yards out. And I think that the progression of Sam shows you that he kept the ball, turned, and a was able to hit Jahan Dotson in rhythm and on time. And I don't want people to harp on that too much. I think Sam is doing an incredible job getting through his progressions. But I'm not going to say I want EB to feed our more top uh, top wide receivers more. Look, I have Jahan. I have Terry on my fantasy teams. I couldn't care less about him. I want the W's. And I'm sure Terry feels the same way, just like EB said today. I don't care as long as we get the job done. You know, it's unfortunate with Logan Thomas and the eight targets that happened. And honestly, I was yelling at my screen for the first drop I saw that, which is putrid. But as your number one tight end target, your quarterback's best friend, you got to catch a football, brother. 
That's why you're here. You're sure-handed. I will say, though, I will say the biggest knock or one of the knocks that people had on Scott Turner last year was he wasn't drawing, drawing up, especially in the first half of the game, first quarters, he wasn't drawing up enough, uh, enough plays to get Terry involved in the game. So, like, again, it's only been one game, so then maybe Terry wasn't 100% obviously and whatnot. But I do think that – because even with Carson Wentz, like, his favorite tar- target obviously was Jahan Dotson. And then Terry kind of got pushed to the wayside for the most part mm-hmm. as far as targets and like as far as like, yeah, targets go. So I do think that when you have a, a great receiver like Terry, you do need to like get him the targets. And like, you don't see the, the Vikings like Kirk Kaiser being like, yeah, I got Justin Jefferson, but I'm going to throw to someone else. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to get my best playmaker of the ball. And Kevin O'Connell draws up plays to get Justin Jefferson open. Justin Jefferson open. So I do think that, uh, like I said, Terry was probably 80% last week. I think he's a little bit healthier this week. He's probably a little bit more explosive this week. And I fully expect Terry to be involved a lot more this week. Yeah, I certainly think that coverage goes a lot into it. And with Vance Yeah, Joseph, of course, of course. With Vance Joseph, expect a lot of blitzes. Expect uh, man coverage, that zone kind of off of it. Sitting in the zone, getting the ball out quick. This is going to be a big game. Uh, for the running backs and being able to block because they, they have to be able to protect Sam Howell. Uh, it's going to it's gonna be difficult against Denver. It should, honestly, even speaking of Terry, like I want Terry to get involved. Obviously, I want Terry to do Terry things, but Patrick Sertan's a great corner. He's definitely like a top two, three, four corner in the league. And if you look at what Jacoby Myers did with the Las Vegas Raiders last week against their number two cornerback, this should be a game for Curtis Samuel, Jahan Dotson, even Deami Brown to uh, kind of do their thing, but definitely Jahan Dotson. But, but again, it's a week-to-week thing, a week-to-week league, so we'll see. But if they try to take away Terry this week, other guys got to step up. Yeah, right now Denver's secondary or defense is ranked 27th against fantasy wide receivers. Uh, I saw that in the ESPN app today. Obviously, Jacoby Myers had himself a day, and all circumstances are different. But we obviously have the talent in the wide receiver room to be able to take advantage of the situation now this next uh, this is not a question but a statement from lord flatulence is this reed's burner account <laughs> it has to be not so much a question but a statement slash concern we will not face a worse team all year and we barely squeaked by without significant improvement on the offense quickly it's going to be painful before it gets better i love what i see out of sam just being a realist yeah i uh, look i mean that's a that's a fair assessment a fair statement the offense definitely has to play better. You're not going to – honestly, you're probably not going to win any games turning the ball over Look, three times. that's what I said to Chick Hernandez because he went after your boy Dan Orlovsky. And, you know, I'm not a big Dan Orlovsky guy. Oh, I yeah, I know. But I, I, like I saw being... that video. Everyone was trying to kill Dan. Like, oh, well, why are you only showing the bad, blah, blah. I took it as – and he even said in the – he even said in, like, the in the tweet. They're he was like, acting. Yes. If they want to win consistently, he has to clean this stuff up. Yes. Yes. It's not like he was like, oh, look at these bad plays by Sam Howell. Uh, yeah, like, Sam no. sucks. Bench him. No. He's saying, right. hey, look, no. you got to yeah. improve on these. And he's right. Exactly. Because Chick Hernandez had tweeted at Dan Orlovsky. He was like, well, how long did it take you to learn? And my yeah. question to Chick Hernandez, and he still hasn't responded to it, was if they, can, if they have that same offensive performance for the next 16 games, realistically, how many games do you think that they can win? And let's be honest about that. And that's the situation here. It's nothing about exactly. them being bad, exactly. not being good enough. They are good enough. They made mistakes. They shot themselves in the foot. And they can. They can. it's correctable, though. This isn't like they just couldn't play against the Cardinals. They shot themselves in the foot and still won. You know, so look, don't kill Dan Orlovsky because he is right at the end of the day. Yeah, and look, at the end of the day, he's definitely right. Like you said, he's right. I'm not even trying to like, because I, like, I like Dan Orlovsky. I'm not even trying to be like, oh, oh, oh but like, you're like you said, you're not going to win any games unless you're facing a team like the Cardinals, turning the ball over three times. And as far as the offensive goes, like, yeah, like they didn't score a lot of points, but like the they AG did what fumble. They needed to. Exactly. The AG fumble killed a drive. Absolutely. The tip pass and the interception they killed, the killed half, a drive. Bro. Exactly. Killed the half. The tip pass was led to an interception, killed a drive. So at the end of the day, like they probably should have put up 24 plus points. Yes. Did they come away with the win? Yes, and that's all that really matters. Should have been 30, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Um, Now the next question is from Andy. Burroughs in the U.K. Oh, love you, brother. With the new deal being signed in the U.K. today, are we getting closer to the U.K. having a full-time franchise? 
Absolutely, I do. I, I do think that's coming down the pipeline. Um, I love the NFL coming out with the Toy Story uh, game at 9.30 a.m. with the London uh, with, in London with the Jaguars and Falcons. I showed it to Cash, dude. Or my wife showed it to Cash. I wanted to see his reaction. She uh, texted me what because I was at work at the time. But he was like, again? Again? Watch? Watch? <laughs> like, he wants to watch a football game now. So he's freaking out. So what we do is we just replay it for him. But I think that the London thing is a leg- is legit. I think the NFL want. I think it's smart for them to do it as well. I know it's a lot on the players. It's a lot of just expenses and moving back and forth. But it, I, everyone loves football, and, and the more we are able to put it out there, I think more people will be receptive to it. You know. Um, I don't think they're gonna put like an NFL team like in Europe, like as far as like the whole thirty-two go, but. I do think that it's progressing to have more than – what do they have, like three games in London a year or something like that? Yeah, I think so. I think it's progressing to have maybe like five games a year or six games a year over in London. But or I don't think there's going to be an actual – like right, exactly. They're going to other other countries as well now. So I do think that uh, – I don't know if it's going to be the next like 10 years there will be a team in London, but maybe like 15, 20 years down the line maybe there might be a team over there. But – I do think that uh, there'll be more games played in London and other countries, and maybe they bring back. Remember the NFL Europe back in the day, and they used to have them on Madden. You can pick like the, like the called Calgary, whatever team yeah, and stuff Jack, like that. The Dragons, <laughs> the drag, the Sea Dragons, yeah, exactly. Teams like that. I do think they're going to bring back NFL Europe as a kind of like a XFL type of thing, like pipeline to like get players to NFL. But I don't think they'll actually be like a legit London. Boiler makers, whatever you want to call them over there. So, boiler makers. Why do you? Why, I, we're, we're just I don't know. I just thought. I, don't, I, I, I just that. randomly thought of. I don't know. I just. I don't know. Oh, you know, I was thinking of London broil, not broiler makers. London broils. <laughs> this next question from Deuce Delicious on Twitter. Thank you, Deuce. Will Butterfingers play next week? Uh, I hope he does. He needs. He needs to get better. Obviously. And, you talking about Logan Thomas? I would imagine, or him, or Kadarius. <laughs> him or Kadarius Tony, Again. Either one. That's another person that people are like. Why is he throwing the ball, playing, practicing quarterback? And he'd be out there on the jug, practicing catching. Well, he's playing catch. So, like, isn't he technically practicing playing, like, catching the ball? He's throwing the ball, playing catch with his teammates. Second of all, again, are we telling Joe Burrow, oh, man, you only threw for 82 yards, though. You got to get back in the lab and throw 100 passes out to practice, man. Like That being said, Joe Burrow is one of the best in the league, of course. Of course, I know, but I'm just saying. I, okay. I understand. That's a great point. It's a great you know point. It's a like, great point. It's are they telling, hey, Joe, man, like, you stunk it up, man. You got to go after practice, go to that net, People 100 targets, do it. I know. But it's okay. Logan, Logan Thomas will be game. fine. It's okay. It happens. Right. You act, like, you act like players never have bad games. Logan Thomas will be fine. Again, he's getting up there in age. If he gets injured, I'm more concerned about the injury part, not the whole yeah. like, oh, he needs to be catching the ball. Or, oh, he needs to be blocking. Like, no. He's getting up there in age. Injury is starting to pile up. That's my only concern. When he's healthy, he's a top half of the league tight end. Simple as that. Look, he's good. The fact is we can all sit here and say Logan needs to have a better game, and I'm sure Logan would have say the same thing. But in the next breath, we don't need to be saying he has to be replaced, he has to be cut, we're wasting money here. Give the guy more time. Um, I think that he has earned that respect, and obviously Terry only had two catches on four or five targets. Are we are we telling Terry, hey man, like get on the jug, man? You dropped three passes. Come on, like no, come, like, be be rational, people. I, w- I will say Logan's were pretty egregious, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it, they, it they definitely were. Just it can't but be it, consistent, just hey. like how and even exactly. though he's a vet, even though if he comes vet. out against Denver and he has brick hands, he's dropping balls, he's missing blocks again, which again. Most I I know it was a random ass defensive end, but like more times than not, you put a defensive end against a tight end. More times than not, defensive end is probably going to win that battle. Yeah, but still, so that's, that's more of like an EB scheming thing. I know, and like a no, sliding the block thing. That wasn't EB's fault. So what happened was is that they Arizona had come out and shown that they were pressuring a lot on the left side. So we had shifted our protection to, yeah, the, to left. the left. Yeah, so yeah. what happened and was, was that, on that left Logan one. It's great design yeah, yeah. by Gannon to kind of force it. And that's what I kind of meant earlier about EB kind of adjusting, you know, having that ready just in case. And that's – it's growing pains, baby, but we still won the football game. It's incredible. Exactly. Last question we have real quick from Hot Take Freddy. Do you think Russell Wilson smokes mids? <laughs> I mean, What's a he's mids? in Denver. Well, you know what mids are. Are you crazy? You don't remember mids, the seeds, like stems? 
Oh, you're just be like doing a bit. Um, <laughs> I mean, he lives in Denver. They got only only gas in Denver, so he probably smokes gas. I mean, if we're being honest, is Russell Wilson? He probably like doesn't smoke anything. He probably like bays in holy water. The so, only yeah. gas that Russell Wilson is smoking out in Denver is Sierras. If we're being perfect, <laughs> yeah. he's inhaling that gas <laughs> Dude, you... from that ass. Um, uh, good. You ever seen Good Luck Chuck? No. Nah. Is it Good Luck Chuck? Which one's the one with Dane Cook? And he's uh he's like every girl he dates they get married right after he. Oh, uh, uh, I forget what it's called. But I know there, what you're talking about. Dude, there is a one part in his boy. He like sees this girl. He's like, man, I'd suck a fart out of her ass like a bong hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a bong hit. <laughs> it's like, dude, what? Like, where are you getting this from? I'll always remember that line, dude. Absolutely hysterical. Uh, okay. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. But real quick before we get out of here, dudes. Let's get your prediction for uh, this, the game on Sunday. Who's, uh, I was just about to say, they are not doing predictions. We didn't do predictions last week either. We did predictions um, with Mitch. Um, I called 23-20. Uh, yeah, 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 right. to 20. Um, I forget. No, you said 16. I think I said, I think I said like 17-15 to 15 or 18-16. Yeah. But I'm willing to uptick the score a little bit. I think that I mean, it's still going to be a close game. I do think that defense is going to have to stop the run. Obviously, Javante Williams and Selmaj P. Ryan. And offense is... We're going to have to not turn the ball over, be more efficient in the run game, and Sam's going to have to at least probably make a play or two to get us over the hump to win the game. But with that being said, I think it is going to be a close one. I still think that Cheeseman, like at some point in the game, there's going to be a bobbled snap, a messed up snap on a field goal, extra point, whatever it may be, and that's going to probably come back to bite us. And I'd say we lose a close one. 22 18 21 to 18 sorry all right i'm done talking crap about uh, the opposing teams um so i'm gonna t- i'm gonna say this in the best way freaking possible all right you catch your football when it's thrown to you you run hard and you don't turn the football over washington wins that simple that freaking simple 23 to 20 get the job done this is going to be a difficult task but I think that we have the bodies in place to be able to get it done. That's the beauty the beauty of having Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, Curtis Samuel. Yeah, you might have Patrick Sertan. That's fantastic for you. Send him over to the side. Let's get to work on the left side here, and let's kick these boys' ass. Um, I want this game for Coach Rivera after what Sean Payton had said. Uh, so 23-20. to 20, And I think, the MV, I think the MVP with Montez Sweat that Sam said, that's a really, really good one. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. Would not be surprised. If this is the Curtis Samuel game, but Jahan Dotson most likely will be the one that's eating. We all know about the matchup with the other cornerback opposite Patrick Sertain. But for me, I think Curtis Samuel might be that guy to, because Denver's so good against the run, you might want to hit those, attack those edges with Curtis Samuel and Antonio Gibson. And I think that might pay dividends in the red zone or something of the sort. All right, everybody. I think MVP is going to be Deron Payne. I think he gets a sack and a half couple like a tackle for loss and he's going to be a disruptor the entire time he's going to get after russ get him outside the pocket maybe throw a pick and cause him to throw a pick but i think deron Payne goes ham on the broncos offensive line Dude, he had such a good they the whole d-line just had such a good freaking game and look we, we were talking crap during the game because we kind of thought the arizona's o-line was doing all right my goodness, when you watch the film, yeah, they nah. were all over the I was going to say, it's way different than like watching it live and then going back and re-watching it on TV. You're like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, dude, it was freaking impressive. Drum Payne's yeah. a monster. All right, everybody, we will see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend. If you're traveling to Denver, have a good time. Don't be getting in fights. Don't go up talking crap to Denver fans. And get, then don't, get your, don't rock a Ray Lewis jersey and get your six-piece in the face. And then get interviewed later on by tv and then and get charged to- by uh with aggravated assault and trespassing and a bunch of other stuff <laughs> all right everybody <laughs> i'm kyle i'm not rocking a ray lewis jersey ever again in my life never have but never will yeah neither have i all right everybody we will see you on monday have a great safe weekend 23 to 20 washington wins we're going 2-0 baby heading into the bills week three washington football Woo! Peace. hey what's up everybody it's kyle i just wanted to say thank you so much for watching and if you liked what you saw Make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. 
Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Hey!